The Holy Prophet went through hard days. When he received the first revelation, he was perplexed and unsure of himself. He did not know what to think of what had happened to him. That's how it was at first. But when revelation came again and again, the Prophet, may God's peace and grace be upon him, became sure that it must be a divine call. He realized that he was entrusted with some great responsibility, the duty to proclaim the message to all men and women. When we are troubled, we tend to open our hearts to people nearest and dearest to us. Such is human nature. And so the Prophet began to tell the news to his close relatives and intimate friends. His wife, Khadija, was the first to believe in him, then his cousin Ali ibn Abi Talib and his friend Abu Bakr. It was not easy for the early Muslims. No one could talk about the revelations that came to the Prophet. No one could utter a word about Islam in public. The Prophet of Allah says the rich must help the poor. The Quraysh won't hear of this. They look down on the poor and exploit them. This isn't the case with Muslims. A Muslim must help fellow Muslims. The poor are entitled to some of the money the rich have. And so it went. They kept preaching Islam for three years in secret. Their mouths were shut except to trustworthy people or close friends. Then came God's command for them to proclaim the message publicly. The Quraysh were in turmoil. The chiefs felt they were a thorn in their side. They met in a club called Darul Nedwa and deliberated on what to do with them. Have you heard the chatter of that nephew of mine? He wants us to throw away the religion of our fathers and grandfathers. He says we must worship only one God, one God instead of our gods. No, you don't say so, Abu Lahab. That's too much. If we allow this nonsense, how are we to get money? Pilgrims come from all over Arabia to worship our many gods. Are we meant now to give away all this money and power for the sake of Muhammad and his riffraff? A bunch of slaves and paupers. And to make it worse, they call me Abu Jahl, father of ignorance. Fools, you are not Abu Jahl, you are Abu al-Hakam, father of wisdom. But Muhammad has exceeded all limits. He says that all people are equal. Fancy that! And what's more, he says that we are all equal in the sight of his God. In other words, you... Abu al-Hakam, and all the nobles of Quraysh are like any of our slaves. And you, Abu Sufyan, what do you say to that? Muhammad's clan, the Banu Hashim, seem to support him. He has never lied, and they see no reason why he would be lying now. Worry not, Abu al-Hakam. His flame will soon blow out. No worthy Meccan will dare to follow him. Even so... I must end his babble and tell everyone that he is a liar and a magician. For who would know him better than me, his uncle? They will say Abu Lahab must be telling the truth. <laughs> Brilliant. Muhammad, say goodbye to your reputation. The true, the trustworthy. Gone with the wind are your titles. And indeed, this is what the idolaters tried to do. They tried to stain the image of the Prophet and call him a liar, but it was all in vain. All the people of Quraysh knew him for what he was, and paid no attention to the lies fabricated about him. Muslims grew in number by the day. The chiefs of the Quraysh began to persecute and torture the Muslims who had no clan or family to protect them, such as slaves and the poor. Bilal was one of these poor Muslims. He was the slave of Umayyah bin Khalaf until Abu Bakr bought him and freed him from slavery. There is only he, the one, the one. My whip hasn't had enough of you. You will have no mercy from me, fool. My whip loves your skin. 
There is only he. The one. The one. Your skin needs some more tanning. <laughs> Bear witness, O oh Quraysh, publish it in Mecca that Umayyah bin Khalaf has dumped his slave Bilal in a sand pitch and made rocks kiss his bones. <laughs> and please tell them that Umayyah has found it great entertainment. <laughs> Mmm, how delighted I was to hear the shrieks of that stupid slave of yours. Foolish Bilal. He could have saved his skin if he had summoned help from our god, Hobal. <laughs> Instead, he continued to shout, There is only he, the one, the one. I do wonder how he could stand all those rocks and lashes. Woe to him! Damn him! I swear by Allah and Al-Uzza that my hand ached from whipping him. Had a stone received that beating, it would have howled of pain. Serves him right. But what makes Abu Bakr buy this contemptible slave? I have no idea. No one had ever offered more than two dirhams for this Ethiopian. And yet Abu Bakr said he would be willing to pay a hundred dirhams had I insisted. You could have made a fortune out of selling this worthless slave. It was foolish of you to have let this opportunity slip by. Oh, cut it out. Stop playing the sage and tell me how we can cripple Muhammad and stifle his propaganda. Good evening. Good evening, Abu Lahab. Evening. What is this row about? Your voices have spoiled my evening stroll. It is this nephew of yours, Muhammad, who is spoiling everyone's peace. I have no nephew. Don't call him my nephew. I have publicly renounced him. Let me but see him anywhere, and I will throw burning logs in his way. And my wife will strew his path with refuse and leftovers. Muhammad will have no peace as long as I live. And so it went. Day in and day out, the Quraysh continued to make the Muslims' lives miserable. No Muslim slave escaped torture. And poor Sumayya, they killed her in cold blood. Sumayya was the mother of Ammar ibn Yasir, who was later to become the first martyr in Islam. And the Prophet, may Allah's grace and peace be upon him, was their number one enemy. They attacked him, they beat him, they swore at him, but he remained steadfast. He bore the pain with fortitude all for the sake of God. He had unshakable faith in God's ultimate victory, and indeed, the patience of Muslims was in the end generously rewarded. Two of Quraysh's strongest and boldest men embraced Islam. They gave such a boost to the small Muslim community and filled it with joy. These two men supported the call to Islam with strength and might. Hamza! Hamza! Did you hear? Abu Jahal called your nephew with bad words and threw sands and stones at him. Woe on Abu Jahal! How dare he offend my nephew! I will teach him a lesson that he will never forget! How dare you hit Muhammad, my nephew and prophet! Take this! Huh. So Muhammad has made you renounce the religion of your fathers and follow his? That magician must have cast a spell on you. And why shouldn't I follow him? All of the Quraysh know that Muhammad is the true, the trustworthy. And he speaks sense. Never will I bow again to your stupid idols. Try to stand in my way, any of you. And then another man joined Islam, and what a man! This was Umar, a man of strong body and resolute mind. He was later nicknamed al faruq the just. He added more power to Islam. Now, with the conversion of both Hamza and Umar, the Quraysh sensed danger. Their presence gave courage to Muslims who began to pray with them, publicly, by the Kaaba. The suffering of the early Muslims was incredible. True, Malik. But their faith was greater than their suffering. 
but I can't bear to think how they could endure all this suffering. The secret is patience. It is the greatest virtue of Islam, Anas. God taught Muslims that if they show patience and reliance on him, he will never abandon them. And what happened next? Did these wicked people of the Quraysh leave the Muslims alone? Not at all, Hajar. They became even more furious than before, and more bitter. They meant mischief and devised plots against the Prophet and his followers. But hardship was a great school for us, and we learned to value patience and to understand that God rewards it well. The Muslims during this time showed extraordinary courage and self-denial. They withstood mockery and overcame torture. Time to go home, children. It's getting late, and your parents will start getting worried. I will see you soon, inshallah.